prepare it for your breakthrough. You may be seated. Lord God, I come to you today. Father, I pray right now that you calm my spirit, my mind, my thoughts, that everything be totally dedicated and devoted to you to share what you have given. I know Satan doesn't want to see someone get a breakthrough today. Therefore, his spiritual torture seemingly of me all this week, Lord, I, I, I stand in your strength right now knowing the victory is already won. You are already in the deliverance business, and I believe by faith you're going to deliver someone from their trial. So, Lord, I stand on your word. Anoint me in your presence. Saturate me in your spirit that I may proclaim nothing but what you have given me. In the precious name of Jesus the Christ, I pray and give thanks. Amen. Ushers, you may be seated. When we face the challenges of life, there is something that we must be very conscious of. We must fight the temptation when we pray of trying to tell God how he is to deliver us when he is to deliver us, and through whom or by what means he's to use for our breakthrough. Now, I'm not saying don't be specific about asking God to grant you a breakthrough in whatever area that you find yourself in need of one. I am saying, however, that you must understand God's way is always the best way. God's method, his timing, by whom he chooses to use in, in delivering us will always be for our good and for his glory. We must learn the lesson for which the storm was given or allowed to occur before we receive our breakthrough. I think I need to repeat that. We must learn the lesson for which the storm was given or allowed to occur before we receive our breakthrough. To get into the breakthrough zone, you have to prepare for it. And you must use the Bible as your source of navigation. God most often desires that we participate in our breakthrough. The McKinney First Baptist Church family and all those who will listen online. If you are here today seeking a breakthrough, humble yourself like a child. Come to God withholding nothing. And with my texts and the Holy Spirit as my guide. I'd like to share with you briefly four object lessons regarding the subject, preparing for a breakthrough. Object lesson number one, every breakthrough is a sovereign act of God. Now, before we walk around key verses in our text, let me offer a little bit of a background. One of the traditional enemies of Israel is the nation of Syria. Damascus is its capital. Israel fought several wars with Syria. The only time these two kingdoms were ever at peace with each other is when they faced the common enemy, and it was the common enemy of the Assyrian king, King Shalbanizer III. The nations of Israel and Syria are arch enemies. But individually, when you are in trouble with a seemingly unsolvable situation with dire consequences, individually, you will be willing to accept or reach out for help from anyone you think can assist you. This text will demonstrate to us 
Every breakthrough is a sovereign act of God. But it will also demonstrate God calls all people to come to him. And he encourages his servants to offer help to all who come. Christians are to use some of our God-given resources to extend God's help to strangers and the foreigners. Now look closely with me as we walk around the text again in verse 1. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Israel, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria, he was also a mighty man of valor. But he was a leper. Now, the name Naaman is a very common name in Syria. It means gracious one or fair. Based on the text, what made Naaman great? Be sure you see how it says it's in the text. In the eyes of his master was he was a supreme commander. He was a great and an honorable man. He was a mighty man of valor. But like every human being, Christian and non-Christian, every last one of us have flaws in our lives. And one of Naaman's flaws was that he was a leper. Now this word leper is a name applied to several different diseases of the skin and it was very highly contagious. And just like AIDS and Ebola in our day, there was no known cure. When it was known that a person had contracted leprosy, that person was separated from the community, ostracized because of it. Naaman was successful on the battlefield, but the text shows us how and why he was successful. Because the source of his success was not his military skill and prowess. The text says that his, his victory came from the Lord. You see, too often we hear people say that I pulled myself up by the, my own bootstraps. That they are self-made man. They, they, they did it on their own. But if you've been reading your book of the month, and I'm sure you have. And most of you have passed chapter 8 by now. I'm sure you have, or you'll get there. But when you get to chapter 8 of the book of the month of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 18 says, It is God who gives you the ability to acquire wealth. So you didn't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It is God who is working in you and through you. Now, since God enabled the pagan general to defeat his covenant people in battle, that also suggests something to us. It lets us know based on the word of God because God promised his covenant people that he would protect them, he would provide for them. So for God to allow them to be defeated in battle, it is also suggestive that the Israelites lost that battle because of unrepentant sin and idolatry. Now, during the time frame of our text, Baal worship was prevalent even in Israel. Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and sexuality. Appeasing the pagan god Baal sometimes required human sacrifice of a child. Well, we can say without shadow or doubt, in our age today, especially in America, Baalism is alive and well. For in America, idolatry, sexual immorality, and abortion are prevalent. Matter of fact, they are the norm for our society. In our text, Naaman needs a breakthrough. He needs, he has a problem that man can't solve. Well, that's the first thing all of us need to know about a breakthrough. It always starts with a God-sized problem. Naaman wakes up one morning, and he realizes that if he, if he doesn't get some help with this leprosy, it's all over for him. He's going to lose his career. He's going to lose his family. He's going to lose his fortune. He's going to lose his position. 
He will have to live in isolation and alienation. Is there anybody here today or listening online that stands in need of a breakthrough? Because there are folk who are dealing with drug addiction, alcohol addiction, sexual addiction. That if they don't get help from the Lord, they too may lose their family. May lose their job. May lose everything that they've worked so hard for. And that problem that they have is a problem that is so great that they cannot solve it on their own. You must have the faith to know that not only can God do it, you've got to have the faith that God will do it for you. You know what's easy to do? Go tell somebody else that God going to work it out. We know that verse. God will work it out for you for your good and for his glory. It's easy to tell that to somebody else. But do we receive our own medicine? When we get in a trial, when we can't see which way is, when it comes down to us, do we have the faith to believe that not only God can, but he'll do it for me? We have to come before him. If we expect him to do this, we got to come before him reverently. You can't approach him any kind of way. God is not your homie. God is sovereign, holy, reverent. He's our father. You got to come before him reverently, humbly, and in repentance to get the audience to, for him to listen to your problem. Object lesson number two. Don't place God in a box and try to limit him. Look at verse two and three. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Now you got to actually put on some sanctified imagination to really grasp what you just read. In most raids by an enemy nation, the men were killed unless they could be used as slaves or they possessed some great talent beneficiary to the captives. The women were most often raped, killed, or they too were used as slaves. The children most often would be separated from their parents and they may even see their parents raped and killed right before their eyes in these raids. Now on one of Naaman's raids, they captured the unknown servant girl in this text. She separated from her family. She's serving the wife of the very man who is the cause of her being a slave and separated from her mother and her father. Naaman is sick with leprosy, which is a disease that had no known cure. But yet this servant girl says to the mistress, to the wife of the man who has her enslaved, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. This passage just blows me away. Now, I have to be honest with you. I, don't, I, I would struggle if I was in that little girl's position. And I, I, I can't emphatically say I would do the very same thing that she did. And if most of you all will be honest, I know you wouldn't do it either. We would probably have kept our mouth shut and let Naaman suffer. Some of us might have even rejoiced knowing Naaman had leprosy and felt it was just punishment for, for his own actions. But instead of the Israelite girl acting like the fallen daughter of Adam, she took the high road of Christ-like behavior and with a simple statement points her master towards the desperately needed breakthrough. You see, if you are in a storm in need of a breakthrough, is it possible that God desires to use you 
in the midst of your unpleasant situation to be a blessing to somebody else? You may be in a marriage and you feel that you've been deceived. You've been done wrong. You may be on the job and feel like the supervisor has bypassed you for a promotion. You may be a sibling and you feel your parents favor another sibling. But if you stay true to the word of God, if you operate in the spirit and not in the flesh, God will bless you and make you a blessing to others. If you are awaiting a breakthrough in your marriage, on the job, in relationships, with a family member, you must remember forgiveness is essential as is total surrender to the Lord. No matter how humble or small your position may be, God can use you to spread his word. God has a divine appointment awaiting you to help you share and explain his word. We just have to be true with the spirit of the Lord. Now look with me at verse four. And Naaman went in and told his master saying, thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Now, first of all, Naaman may have been a decorated member of the army, but he couldn't just leave Syria without permission. And since this is you, Sunday, youth, <laughs> Uh, since you live under your mama and daddy's household, you do not have permission to just leave when you want to either. Oh, I just thought I'd throw that in for free. Just throw it in. Next in the text, Naaman, listen to the advice of the servant girl because it was godly advice. And it was advice that gave him encouragement that a breakthrough was possible. As we get prepared for our breakthrough, we must be sure the advice that we listen to and or follow is godly advice. Watch out for who you hang around with. You see, when you, when you are searching for a breakthrough, get away from faithless people, complaining folk. Folk who always got an excuse for why this, that, and the other is going on. You need to get around some people who say stuff like, and my God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You need to get around somebody that say, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You see, that's the kind of talk when I hear it that it just upbuilds me, that touch my soul and make me want to go on. But see, when you are seeking God and desire to hear from him, you actually can hear three voices. God's voice, the voice of your fleshly desires, and Satan's voice. And it's the word of God that will let you know which one of them voices is speaking that, that is the Lord. Because God does, do, does not do anything inconsistent with his, his word. Matter of fact, in John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, my sheep. You notice he didn't say everybody. He didn't say all the sheep. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. So when folk are talking to you about how you need to deal, especially in marriages, oh, just leave him. Just leave. You don't need to stay in this. Look at what the words say. That isn't what God says. What you need to do is get around somebody that will remind you that, that God gives marriage this thing called a ministry of reconciliation. Satan is a liar every time you go to court and there is a divorce that says irreconcilable differences. That is the exact opposite of what the word of God says because God says, I give you the ministry of reconciliation. Now, it may not sound good, but I know it's good for you. So when your unsaved friends Attempt to give you advice. Don't follow any advice that don't line up with scripture. It will not lead to a breakthrough. 
but rather it's going to lead to a breakdown and some desperation. Do not try to place God in a box and limit him. Our little minds cannot conceive a sovereign, all-knowing, all-seeing, everywhere at the same time kind of God. God has people and opportunities already in place to help lead you to your breakthrough. And in our text, God, notice this, God allowed this Israelite girl to be in captivity and Naaman was God's instrument of bringing her to the, his house. But as we will soon see, it was for a special occasion. It was like what Esther, in the book of Esther, it was for such a time as this. It was for an opportunity where God was going to establish and show Naaman, who will go back and tell others that our God works are great and mighty. And the works of God are going to be displayed in his life when he yields to God's way. Object lesson number three. Be willing to make sacrifices. Look at five and six. Then the king of Israel said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. Now, the first thing that this that, that these verses point out is that Naaman's willingness to sacrifice further establishes the groundwork for his miracle. Naaman, look at what he did. He gathered up all of his belongings, his gold, the silver, 10 changes of clothing, and brought in a whole entourage of people, and they set on a journey with the hopes of Naaman receiving his breakthrough. Naaman was willing to pay any price, give any gift, and make any sacrifice. You see, it does not matter if you need a breakthrough in your marriage, in your finances, with your children, on the job, you must be willing to sacrifice if you want to experience a breakthrough. Now you can't, let me say this also, you can't buy God's favor. You can't trick God by acting good for a season. You know how it is when we're really, really down and out and trouble is all around. We can act good for a season. Yeah, but see, God knows everything that God does, everything that you're going to do pleasing to him is going to be something that's a matter of the heart. Now, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to offer up to God sacrifices. And for you, a sacrifice may mean separating yourself from people who encourage you to sin. You're going to have to watch your company that you keep. You need to, it, your sacrifice may be, you need to get up earlier than normal to ensure that you have private devotion time. See, if you wait until the day and say, I'm going to read the Bible at some point today, guess what? Satan going to make sure you are as busy as a bee so that you won't have time to, to, to get with, with the Lord in the word and in prayer. What you're going to have to do is make the sacrifice that say, I'm going to get up 20 minutes, 30 minutes earlier than normal to ensure I have private time with the Lord. But see, you know what our problem is? Our problem too often is Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3. Y'all know what that, that verse says? I'm going to read it to you because if you don't hear it come from the Bible, you might think I just threw this in. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3 says this, do not love sleep. Least you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will be satisfied with bread. Now see, I didn't put that in there. God put that there. He said, don't love sleep. Some of us know. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Five naps a day is, that might be about average. What the Lord is trying to say to us is, time is precious. You can't buy it back. What we do on this side, while we're alive, is what's going to determine our eternity. Now, a sacrifice to others may mean you need to turn off the TV 
Stop watching programs that promote and highlight sinful living and instead pick up your Bible. There are programs that are on, you don't have to go to K, go to HBO, Cinemax, and, and all that kind of stuff. They got all of these kind of things, as I shared in Bible study last week. Uh, programs dating naked, naked and afraid, naked in this, naked in that. They're all over the regular cable channels where you parent, if you don't know they exist, guess what? Your kids can watch them and you don't even know what's going on. Now, I know somebody that's a youth mad out and bust their bubble and shared that statement. But I'm going to tell you something. We, what we allow to go in our, our eye gate and in our ear gate eventually is something we strive to live out. Now, but the sacrifice that I have found personally. The sacrifice that I read in the Bible most often that has led to the greatest breakthroughs in the lives of those in this Bible, I will attest as it has led to the greatest breakthroughs in my life, is you must be willing to offer God the sacrifice of praise and worship. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15 through 16 says it like this. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. And that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Praising and worshiping God is a sacrifice. Why? Because it's not something that we naturally want to do. For the people who say, it's not my personality. Yeah, I, I, it's not my personality to be emotional in the service. I don't say amen out loud. I don't lift up holy hands. I don't care what song they sing in, in the choir. I'm not standing up and I'm not going to sing with the choir because it just don't take all that. Maybe this is the very reason why you are seeking a breakthrough and hadn't received it just yet. Because God may simply have you in that storm to teach you how to praise and worship him. Sometimes God allows you to hit rock bottom so that you will come to shout about the rock who is at the bottom. And that rock our choir just sang about, that rock is Jesus. So when you hit the bottom and you realize, oh, I can't go no further with man, nobody here down here with me, cry out to Jesus. That rock will not lead you astray. And if you want to experience break, a breakthrough, you must be willing to offer. You must be willing to offer the sacrifice of praise. Now, don't try to manufacture uh, 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 praise and worship now. We can't fool God. We can't trick God. You see, God is not as concerned about how high you jump when you shout. He's more concerned about how straight you walk when you come down. Object lesson number four. Simple obedience to the word of God leads to breakthroughs. Look with me at verse seven and eight. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. First of all, verses seven through eight represent a misunderstanding. The unnamed Israelite slave girl said in the text, that the unnamed prophet from Samaria, that unnamed prophet of God, is the one who could heal Naaman. She did not say that it was the king of Israel. You see, our God moves in strange and unusual ways. 
See, you can't try to limit God and place him in a box. Don't think that that, that, that folk that, that, that are in the church, been in the church forever, that, don't think that people who are preachers, pastors, and deacons, that we the only one that know how to talk to God, that know how to get a word to God. All of us who are Christian are priests. Anybody who know God as Lord and Savior can cry out to the master and he can hear them and do anything. Don't you think that you got to come just to the pastor and just to the deacons or just to the servant leader to get you get a word to the Lord. You just need to get it to somebody that know the Lord. And if you want to experience a breakthrough, you better be open to and embrace change. I am so tired of hearing people say this one phrase. This is the way we always used to do it. Let me tell you something. God, what God does in 2000, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. But the way he had to move on folk in 2000 might be a little different than how he got to move on you in 2014. Hopefully you've grown a little bit. Hopefully you've matured a little bit. And guess what? Now he needs to work in you, not a new way, but a different way. And when he works in you in a different way, what that does, it takes away from you believing that it was you that did it. Sometimes God will make change just to show the pastor, just to show the deacons, the trustees, the ministers, the servant leaders, it ain't about us. Whatever good is being done is the good God is working through us. And he oftentimes will change it up to make certain we don't try to take credit for it. The power to heal and deliver resides in God and God alone. He's sovereign. He can work through anyone he chooses and can do whatever he chooses to bring about your breakthrough. Know that God never deviates from his word. So being open to and embracing change, that does not mean being tolerant to sin or participating in sin. God does not deliver you from financial poverty and his delivery mechanism is, is that you're going to take what little money you do have and go to the casino and gamble it because that's your best chance of getting more money. He's not going to tell you to go down to the corner of the store and go buy you some lottery tickets because you're about to scratch off and scratch into the, to a blessing. He's not going to tell you to do anything illegal or immoral for money. God's delivery method will always be consistent with Scripture. Verses 9 through 16 are so interesting. Having received the necessary paperwork to go into the enemy territory, from verse 5, Naaman and his, and his entourage arrive at Elisha's residence expecting the prophet himself to come out and to show him some hospitality and some respect. But look at what Elisha does in the text. In verse 6, Elisha sends a messenger. And the messenger says, go on down to the, to the Jordan and dip seven times. Oh Lord, now. Their journey from Syria to Elisha's house, that was about 100 miles. Now here comes Elisha's servant, not Elisha himself, but his servant coming to Naaman and saying, now go another 20 miles and y'all walk down there to the dirty old Jordan River. Elisha's instructions were simple and emphatic. Go wash seven times. And you will be restored. Elisha knew that Naaman had to be humbled before he could be healed. You see, that's where most of us are at, at the, in the breakthrough zone. God has to humble us before he can break through for us. Now, I'm not talking about what I read about. I'm talking about what I know from my own personal life. God has to break you down so that all you can say is, Lord, have mercy on me. But when he gets you there, you like putty in his hands. He can mold you. He can shape you. You can be usable. 
But if you come now already made, already telling God what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, how you're going to worship and how you not going to worship, what Sundays you come into church, what Sundays you not coming, Lord, I'm going to come, but I'm coming on first Sunday only. That's my Sunday. But I still want you to give me a 365-day blessing, but I'm only going to come on when I feel like coming. You see, before sinners can receive God's grace, they must submit to God's will. God resists the proud, but he gives what? He gives grace to the humble, according to 1 Peter 5 and 5. And of the six things in Proverbs 6 that God says he hates, the number one thing on his list is a proud look. In verse 11, because Naaman was a pagan, he thought Elisha should have personally come outside and say something like abracadabra, hocus pocus, poof, now be gone, leprosy. Like he was some kind of pagan magician or something. Look at verse 12. The rivers of Damascus were known for their pristine beauty. I read and I, I went and looked at them on the, on the internet. And I read about where some, some missionaries, they went there and they just talked about how they just went to the uh, Abana and the far, far rivers and they just, it, they had picnics there. They, they said the water is crystal clear, it's cool that these rivers that come, they flow out of, out of Mount Lebanon and they, and they are the most pristine rivers m many say they've ever seen in the world. But that's not where God told him to go dip. He said go down to the Jordan. Now, the Jordan is a muddy river. It's, it's, it's kind of like an odd day, like the Mississippi or the Red River. God was actually working on Naaman's pride when Elisha did not come to royally greet him. And now he was going to have to go wash in the dirty old Jordan. You see, it was not the quality of the water that would bring his breakthrough of healing. It was... It was being obedient to God's prophet who spoke God's word that would bring about the breakthrough. Church, we are not saved or healed by doing good works. We can't tip God enough in the offering basket to encourage him to save us, deliver us, or to heal us. It is when we submit to God, lay down our pride, and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me. Lord, I'm in this situation. I don't know how to get out of it. Lord, if you don't show up, I'm going back and do the very thing I have been doing. But I recognize because of your word, because of what your man of God has said, that this way of living is sinful. Therefore, I'm coming to you saying, Lord, have mercy. See, when you can come like that, then God can do what he can do. Until then, he's going to let you do what you're doing for a season. Now, in verse 13, Naaman's servant gave Naaman some wise, godly counsel. There are many people who never experience their breakthrough because they're trying to apply worldly advice to a spiritual problem. The text says Naaman was willing to do any hard task to be healed, so why not be just as eager to do a simple task? Sometimes people react to their seemingly unbearable burden, their mountain of debt and financial problems, or their decade-long sinful habit, and they think the simple advice of repent and be converted. Pray and have faith. Accept God's forgiveness is just too simple a solution to their humongous problem. Notice Naaman did not get healed until he acted upon the simple word from God's servant. It was, it's when we begin doing God's will that we will begin to experience our breakthroughs. Verse 14 reflects when Naaman came up from the water the seventh time. Not the first, not the second, not third, fourth, fifth, or sixth, the seventh time. Seven is a number of completion. He had him do it seven times just to make sure that he was going to exhibit some faith. Because see, when nothing didn't happen the first time, he could have easily just gave up and said, this is not it. Oh, don't you see the correlation to how we pray? We get on our knees. 
one time pray, God, have mercy on me. I need you to do this, this, and that. And it don't happen the next day, guess what? We're about ready to give up. Or well, we might do it one more time. We might do it two more times. But when we persevere, it's the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man that's going to avail much. God want to know, do you really want what you're asking for? And when you keep on praying for something, especially for something that God knows you don't even need, that he already knows is going to bring about trouble. When you keep praying, when you get in your devotion time with the Lord, he'll reveal to you that that's really not what he had for you. He may show you what you asking for is too small. I got something bigger, better, greater for you. You asking too small. Praise the Lord. So when Naaman dipped that seventh time and he came up and his skin was, was, was like a baby's, in New Testament language, Naaman was born again. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3 says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. God desires to save, to heal, to deliver, to bring reconciliation in your marriage. He desires to heal broken families and employee relationships. We just have to repent and humbly submit to God's way and not your way. We just have to submit to God's timeline, not your timeline. You have to submit to whom and by what means God chooses to use, not who you choose. God to, to, to use in your breakthrough. God may allow you to be in a financial storm that causes you to have to come to the doorsteps of the church to have to ask for help or he may have you go talk to a family member who has the material means to help you but because y'all have broken family relationship you hadn't been in touch with. And God is using that storm to bring about reconciliation. You think you need $200, but God is trying to say you, you need your fellowship restored. God may allow you in your storm to occur because he knows that when, when you have that financial storm and he delivers you, when we get here on fourth Sunday and when that deacon stands here holding the benevolent basket, you will be much more inclined to want to give in the benevolent offering because you knew how hard it was for you to have to take yourself to the church and to the deacon and ask for help. God put us in situations so that we can be able to be blessings to others, so that we can be able to help others. Most of the time, or many times, your storm is not just for you. It is so that God can use you in ministering to another. Now look at the last two verses, verses 15 and 16, as we run to a close. It says, and he returned to the man of God. He and his aides and came and stood before them. And he said, indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman became a new man following his Jordan River experience. Now, he was a new man. If you keep reading, he, he didn't have it all right. He's just like any other new Christian. He's saved, now he need to be discipled. So Naaman is now saved. And, and notice when Naaman was saved and was healed, he did not immediately return to Damascus. That's important to understand in the text. Because what the writer is suggesting to us is that Naaman didn't leave, save, and go back living the way he did before. He didn't go back to Damascus. What did he do First, he returned to God's servant, Elisha's house. The same one that earlier disrespected him in his own eyes by sending out his servant and he didn't personally come there. But look at what the text says. Look who met him now. Elisha was at the door, standing there. He received Naaman. Why? Naaman now had been humbled. Naaman now was cleansed. Naaman now is ready to hear from the man of God. 
He refused to accept Naaman's money to show that God's favor cannot be purchased. How many times have we heard some TV ministers say, sow a seed in my ministry and you will receive a blessing in so, so many days. Send in 1995 and I'll send you a prayer handkerchief. Some holy oil. Just dip it and dab it and it's all going to come away. And only they are the ones who benefiting and being blessed. No, that is not how it works. Naaman had just been saved. Therefore, what he received could not be purchased. Jesus paid it all. Not in this text for, uh, for Naaman, but he paid it all for us. And the same methodology that was done then is still by belief, by faith in God. It says in the Old Testament, Abraham believed and it was accounted for his righteousness. So the same way folk got to know Jesus in the Old Testament, in essence, it's the same way in the New Testament, which means belief in God. It means believing that God has done something already for you. And Naaman, he saw a man that was just saved. There's no way he could have taken his gift because it, it, would have, it would not have been an appropriate thing for all of the pagan people that were around him. Naaman refused the gift, not that it is saying that a minister or a pastor can't receive a, a gift if, if, if they've been instrumental in any aspect of your life. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that there's a time and a place and an and a opportunity that exists for that. And to do that publicly around folk that don't know any better, you would be then hindering their faith and their belief. When Naaman came back to the house, and when he came to Elisha's and when he made the public statement about there was no other God but the God of Israel, a New Testament translation of that would be Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. That says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you're here today and in need of a breakthrough, remember every breakthrough is a sovereign act of God. Don't place God in a box and try to limit him. Be willing to make sacrifices, especially the sacrifice of praise and worship. And do not forget, simple obedience to the word of God always leads to breakthroughs. Let us pray. My father, I come to you today thanking you in advance that I know what has been shared with your people line up with your word. It is what you have given to me, therefore I stand in belief that you are going to allow it to break through in the lives of those that it was destined for. Whether we hear in, about it here today or some point after today, Lord, that's not that important. The most important thing is that they contact you that they call on your name, that they seek your face, that they remember that, the, that the, the primary method of breakthrough is gonna be when they obey you, when they obey your word, when they put their faith and their trust in you. And I pray if there is one here today who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, no matter how long they've been doing a particular sin, no matter how long they've been out in the world, today can be a brand new day. Today they can take their dip and they, and today they can be made clean because you said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and then cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Move on the hearts, the minds, and the souls that you have destined for this word on this day, whether they be those here today or whether it be those who will listen online. We love you, we thank you, and praise you in the matchless name. But Jesus the Christ, do I pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. With our ministers, deacons, faith counselors, would you please join me? The doors of the church are now open. If you are here, first and foremost, and do not know Jesus the Christ as your Lord and your Savior, the first call is for you. You, can, you could have been in church all your life. 
But that doesn't necessarily mean being in church does not equate with salvation. Salvation starts with God, goes through God, ends with God. Salvation is if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. That is the only way you can be saved. If you have not done that, today is the day to get it right. Doors of the church are open. If you're here and you're searching for a church home, because in the book of Hebrews, it tells us, forsake not the assembly of yourselves. The, that word forsake in the Greek is a command. It derives from a Greek word that says, come and keep on coming to the house of God. Come and keep on coming, assembling yourself with God's people. It's a command. So if you're searching for a church home, all I can say is this is what we teach and preach. Because when we talked about breakthroughs, if you listen to what you hear in a lot of popular songs, it say, claim your blessing, reach up and grab it out the sky. It say, tell your storm, get behind you. But you know what it don't say? It doesn't tell you that what has to happen first is you got to get on your knees and you got to repent. It doesn't say that you got to live a holy life. It doesn't say that you have to surrender all to the Lord. You can't choose when God is going to deliver you, bless you. It is all up to God. That's why he's sovereign. But we can come to him in an emergency. Because Psalm 50 and 15 says, call on me in the day of trouble. Said, I'll hear you, I'll rescue you. But there's a reason that you may glorify my name. So if you're ready to be delivered, but yet you don't want to go back and tell what God has done in your life. You don't have to be specific with the details. You just need to say, God has delivered me. The reason we don't get deliverance is because we don't, we're not willing to do it God's way. Is there one in the house today?